Hi, this is uh, Jack Sadler from the University of British Columbia. I'm fortunate to be the uh, co-task leader with uh, my colleague Jim McMillan at NREL. And uh, this presentation is a, a summary of some of the work that we're doing in Task 39 in this current triennium, which is coming to uh, an end at the end of this year. Next slide, please. So this is a very quick summary of the uh, countries that are all part of uh, Task 39. You can see each of the countries here with the main contact people. Uh, and if you look at the, the website, Task 39, I think if you want more information, please contact uh, us through the uh, website that's here. Next slide, please. So Task 39 is, uh, is entitled Commercializing Commer Conventional Advanced Transport Biofuels from Biomass and Other Renewable Feedstocks. At the bottom of the slide, you can see that we cover both technology and policy. Uh, I think the, there's a general feeling that fossil fuels will probably be cheaper than uh, renewables for quite some time. So you need the policy, policies such as uh, the low carbon fuel standard in British Columbia. And we're also looking at the relative maturity of some of the technologies. Uh, I should also mention the network is increasingly looking at long distance transport. So those areas which is gonna be difficult to uh, electrify. Next slide, please. This is a, a snapshot of the, of the reports that, uh, that the task has produced. So again, I encourage you to go onto the website here. It covers everything from co-processing to drop in fuels to the marine uh, sector. Uh, there should be both the biojet and the biomarine reports up, updates that should be publicly available on the website uh, sometime over the next uh, few months. Next slide, please. This really shows the pie chart of the three areas we're working in. We have a multifaceted commu communication strategy at the bottom. We, we publish three uh, newsletters a, a year, which is coordinated by my colleague, uh, uh, Mahmoud Abadian. Uh, but we also look at the technology aspects and the policy side. And we're fortunate to have uh, uh, people that take the lead in each of these sectors from around the country. Next slide, please. Uh, one example I'll, I'll highlight here is the Task uh, 39 report in 2014. This was on the potential and challenges of drop in biofuels. You'll see that one of the uh, aspects here was to how do we, what do we define? What's the definition of a drop in fuel? And all the logos on the right are the examples of the companies that we ran the draft past because it was important that these uh, companies all had some input into what was in the report. Next slide, please. And here is the definition of drop-in biofuels. A drop-in biofuel is a liquid biohydrocarbon that's functionally equivalent to petroleum fuels and fully compatible with the existing petroleum infrastructure. So we tried to come up with a chemical definition, but uh, that proved too difficult. So this is the uh, definition that we're using in terms of drop-in biofuels. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, uh, please go online we, uh, and to, to uh, increase publicity. This has also been published here uh, with regard to co-processing. This is an update of the report. And uh, in the world just now, there's quite a few oil companies that are doing co-processing as a way to reduce the carbon intensity of their different fuels. Uh, and again, this report uh, will be updated and it should be this summer when the update of this report will be available. Next slide, please. So uh, drop-in biofuel can use a similar process to petroleum refining. So if you look at uh, cracking, hydro-processing, uh, there's a high hydrogen requirement to remove the oxygen from the biogenic feedstock. So uh, at the bottom of the slide here, you can see that refining uh, co-processing can reduce the investment cost because you can make use of the facilities there. It will reduce the carbon intensity of the fuels and uh, it has other aspects such as lowering the sulfur, which is very important for biomarine. This, uh, one of the challenges though, is following the green molecules and some of the members of our group, particularly Jumping Soon, our group is spending a lot of time trying to figure out what are the best ways to follow those green molecules and where did they go? Which fraction did they go into? Next slide, please. So this is a very quick summary of where the insertion points could be, whether it's gonna be the FCC, fluid catalytic uh, cracking down there, or the different hydro cheaters. So these are the various insertion points that are being studied. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have been looking at what are potential feedstocks. So just now, uh, almost 100% of the feedstocks which are being co-pressed just now are what we call conventional. So they're lipid derived. Uh, used cooking oil and tallow, for example, are in demand because they're low carbon intensity. 
but increasingly companies are using things like canola, uh, rapeseed, uh, which are a bit higher carbon intensity. What's a bit further out though, is using what we call biocrudes. This is based on pyrolysis or hydrothermal liquid using biomass as the feedstock, or it could be algae or, or sewage sludge. Uh, the problem right now is there's not enough uh, volume available off these biocrudes to do any co-processing studies. Next slide, please. So the key challenges of co-processing is that uh, we, there's uh, li limited refinery data, as I just mentioned. Uh, we don't really know some of the reactions that are underway. Uh, we don't understand the, the impact on products and quality, such as corrosion. Uh, so this really is a summary of some of the points that we are focusing on within Task 39. And uh, a highlight is the methods used for determining the renewable content. This is something we're currently working on, and uh, it's using aspects such as material balance combined with C14 tracking. Next slide, please. So uh, tracking the green molecules, as I mentioned, this is what Champing is looking at. Uh, the real emissions must be achieved through co-processing. We need to have policy incentives to make uh, the refiners follow this. The low carbon fuel standard that's actually used in British Columbia and in California is uh, one of the, the methods we think is a good policy to incentivize people. Uh, and as I said here, the, what we're looking at is C14 uh, tied in with mass balance. But then again, it's uh, depending on the level of co-processing, if it's a low level, like 5%, sometimes the background noise uh, has a bigger influence than uh, the, the change in, uh, that results from uh, co-processing some of these low, uh, these biogenic feedstocks. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, the summary here, the advantage of co-processing is that we can uh, produce uh, lower carbon intensive fuels without a big capital uh, investment. Uh, we think this can be done relatively quickly. Uh, we also think it creates a market in the short term for these biocrudes. So uh, people that make the bioils and biocrudes, uh, such as the Ensigns or the BTGs or the Lysellas, they would have a market for these products. And most importantly, we think we can get the petroleum refineries as uh, allies in terms of trying to decarbonize. And, and the benefit, obviously, is you have an improved quality feedstock, so uh, higher, ox, uh, higher octane gasoline, higher cetane diesel, and a lower sulfur material. Next slide, please. The, uh, there is great demand for this material. Aviation in particular, which I think has been really hit hard because of COVID. Uh, however, there's a recognition that as things recover and people start getting back into planes, that uh, there will be a requirement to reduce the carbon intensity. So the uh, aviation sector has been a big champion uh, on making uh, biojet or what's called sustainable aviation fuel. And we think co-processing could play a key role in increasing the volumes available of low carbon intensity jet fuel. Uh, and also if you look at ASTM in terms of certification, they recently approved the lipid co-processing for producing uh, biojet fuels or basically lower carbon intensive jet fuels using uh, co-processing. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a high priority for Canada. Uh, if you go online, you can see the sky the limit challenge. So uh, Canada itself, if you look to the top right, you'll see that uh, it goes back to 2018. And it's not quite announced. It's supposed to be sometime around now that a grand prize winner will be announced. There's three finalists that you can look at. The, there's three finalist technologies that are out there. And uh, they will win a prize of uh, $5 million. So this is uh, using a Canadian example about high how high a priority the uh, production of low carbon intensive jet fuel is. Next slide, please. Uh, the work that we have done is uh, being sponsored by Boeing. So as well as Task 39, Boeing has been uh, generously funding some of this work. Uh, we sourced three bio crudes or bio oil from different providers. We looked at upgrading it. We looked at the feedstock supply logistics, life cycle analysis, and we uh, looked at a demonstration plan, concept, and design. So again, this report is online. Next slide, please. Uh, Boeing was the main funder. Uh, our Canadian airline Bombardier, which is now tied in with Airbus, our two major airlines, WestJet and Air Canada. And we work with Sky Energy on downstream logistics. So these are the main partners on the project. Next slide, please. 
And the uh, ATM, the, the bio oil came from three different sources, BTG, VTT, and our house. And uh, again, if you go into the full report, you can see how it was made, how it was upgraded, and how it impacted the quality and particularly the carbon intensity of the feedstock. Next slide, please. <coughs> the conclusions is that uh, we could make Biogen technically, uh, it in increased our knowledge, uh, and we integrated the technical life cycle analysis. And we can see that co-processing should be able to provide the lower carbon intensity fuel for these different sectors. So again, we saw carbon reduction of about uh, 80% could be achieved. Uh, so the challenge now is scaling this up and uh, for example, getting the volumes of bio crude that a refinery can actually use for co-processing. Next slide, please. So the, the, the final conclusions here is that uh, co-processing can, can use existing refinery infrastructure to produce lower carbon intensive fuels. We think there's significant uh, global interest, did not have enough time to cover that. Uh, it's, it's partially, I would say, primarily driven by policy, such as the low carbon fuel standard. The co-processing and other types of refinery integration can increase the production of drop-in, uh, rather than biofuels, drop-in lower carbon intensity fuels. And uh, the, uh, the key role that cost availability and sustainability of the feedstock will will play is both in conventional, that's in, in the lipid feedstocks and advanced, what we're calling the biocrud feedstocks. Next slide, please. The, uh, what's also happening in Canada is uh, federally, we're looking at the cute clean fuel standard. Uh, this is a process, we just uh, had a, a, provincial, a federal budget and the decarbonization is very high profile. So again, this is the sort of uh, policy that is driving uh, the production of lower carbon intensive fuel. So that's at the federal level. Next slide, please. At the provincial level, again, if you go online, you can look at our Clean BC plan. Uh, Clean BC is a path to uh, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it's to encourage people to move away from fossil fuels to lower carbon intensity fuels. And the, the goal is to increase the supply of renewable fuels to about 650 million litres by 2030. And uh, I think as some of you will know, BC is a, uh, has a well-established forest sector. Uh, I, I mentioned many times the best way to do carbon capture and storage is actually to grow a tree and make a, a building that will last for hundreds of years, but there's always residue left, left over. So that residue, which kind of is used for a, a pellet sector right now, those pellets could be easily used as a feedstock to produce the bio crudes to uh, decarbonize transport. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so, uh, thanks Jeff, thanks. So this is my last slide. Uh, as I said, what I've just tried to do here is to summarize uh, the work that uh, Task 39 is doing. Uh, I think it's been a very effective partnership. Uh, we're lucky to have uh, representation from Brazil. Our Brazilian colleagues are invaluable in terms of being able to grow the crop a lot quicker than we can in, in BC. So I encourage you to go on the website here, look at all the activities that uh, Task 39 is involved in. And I wanna thank the organizers for allowing me to make this uh, uh, presentation, uh, which I assume will be posted. And uh, please let me know if there's any questions. My, webs my web address is jack.sadler at ubc.ca. But uh, thank you very much for your attention, and thanks very much, Jumping. Hello, my name is Don O'Connor. I'm the president of s and Square Consultants, Inc. We're the developers of the GHGNES LCA model, as well as we use a number of other models doing LCAs, mostly on biofuels, for companies around the world. Today, I want to talk about two things. First of all, lifecycle inventory data quality issues. And secondly, the treatment of co-products in various regulatory systems. So first of all, talking about data quality. Lifecycle analysis results are totally dependent on the quality of the data being used. ISO LCA standards talk about primary and secondary data. So primary data is the information that is under the direct control of the person who is authorizing the study, typically the biofuel producer. So that's things like feedstock consumption rates, energy use, types of energy, chemicals, those kinds of things. 
Secondary data is the information that is not under the direct control and would typically be feedstock or fuel use related. So information related to the people who are sending materials in to the biofuel plant. Now secondary data in LCA work is usually aggregated data from maybe government sources, other studies or surveys. Um, it can be old. It could be taken from a different region than the one that you're studying. It might use different technologies than the one that you're looking at. It could be just an expert estimate and not based on actual data. Um, or it could be based on a very small data set, just a couple of individual um, operations. There's quite a bit of information in the literature about how to assess data quality that goes into life cycle assessment or life cycle inventory databases. So this is uh, one slide that I've taken from a paper that was presented about prepared about 15 years ago. Um, but it's still used today and you can find some other um, very similar data quality scorecards. Um, so here we're looking at five different aspects of data quality. The reliability of the data, the completeness of the data, the temporal coverage of the data, the geographical coverage, and the methodology, the technologies that are covered. And they rank them all from one to five. So ideally, we'd have a data set that is one for all of these individual um, characteristics. Unfortunately, that's not always the case, um, and uh, we can find uh, data sets and commercial databases um, that at this point in time have an awful lot of fives in them. Um, I think one of the primary um, challenges is keeping all of these data sets up to date. You know, we're ideally, we're looking for information that's uh, uh, a less than three years difference to the uh, year of the study that we're doing and the year that the data um, was collected. That's actually a pretty short time frame when you consider how long it takes to uh, collect data, um, analyze it, and uh, get it published. That's uh, one of the major uh, problems of some of the data sets. Um, the other is reliability. Um, and so many of them are not based on uh, verified data that's based on measurement. Um, some of them, uh, there's a number of data sets out there that are widely used um, that are at best a number four. Um, so they're a qualified estimate um, by an industry expert, but nevertheless a qualified um, estimate. Um, and so each of these five um, aspects of data quality is important. Um, and I want to briefly talk about um, the, some of the challenges of uh, making sure we have a data set that's a, a one, 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 um, and not a five, 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 five. Um, so I want to bring your attention to a recent uh, study that was commissioned by uh, DG Klima in the EU. Um, they commissioned Ricardo Energy and Environment um, together with uh, two other um, consultants to provide a life cycle analysis of transportation sector options. Um, and this uh, environmental assessment was to, all, was to include all stages of the life cycle. And uh, Ricardo said that one of the key objectives of this study uh, is to combine past knowledge from the literature as well as the knowledge and expertise from the project team and the stakeholders to propose a comprehensive methodology filling past data and methodological gaps as well as developing and applying more novel uh, aspects to further enhance the analysis. Um, so pretty lofty goals. Um, and I think that some aspects of this study were uh, very well done, uh, particularly when they looked at the vehicle side of the picture. The fuel um, side of the picture, and particularly the um, alternative fuels, um, not quite so well done. Um, and the problem was that in many cases, this study utilized data um, that was more than 20 years old. Um, and so they had the task of trying to develop a new LCA tool from scratch, uh, which uh, requires an awful lot of data. Um, and so rather than do that, in some cases, they use data uh, from existing lifecycle databases. Um, and some of those databases we find when we dig into it, um, some of the data in those is 
pretty old. And so I'm just going to give you one example in this talk today, which is how they modeled wheat production uh, inputs. Um, and so this is wheat produced um, in the European Union. Um, and here are sort of the key five key uh, parameters uh, that determine the carbon intensity of the wheat um, as it leaves the farm. We have the yield, we have the nitrogen fertilizer application rates, the phosphorus fertilizer, the potash fertilizer, and the fuel consumed um, by the tractors and combines and the like. So there's the Ricardo values, um, and I've also compared them to the values um, that the JRC put together for their default values, which showed up in the default values for the um, for the red two. Um, and so you can see we have large uh, differences, um, and they're all you know essentially going the same way. Um, so the JRC has a yield that's 64% higher um, than what Ricardo used, and there's certain countries in Europe that are even higher yield than that. They are using 30% less nitrogen fertilizer and of course um, nitrogen is the most carbon intensive of the fertilizer so that's important. Um, the amount of phosphorus that was added was uh, the GRC value is 72% less uh, than Ricardo's number. Um, the, uh, the potassium fertilizer 84% um, less for the GRC and the fuel use in terms of um, liters of fuel per ton of grain 23% less uh, for, for the JRC. And so you can imagine that putting all of those numbers together, uh, we ha would have much higher emissions from the Ricardo study than the JRC. Um, and in fact, the numbers were almost uh, twice as high um, because we could drill in further and we could find old emission factors for nitrogen fertilizer, uh, for example, uh, rather than the, the latest data that's available. Um, so whenever we have um, industrial sectors that are making rapid technological change um, due to environmental pressures or, or um, economic pressures, we'll see large changes in the GHG emission reductions. Um, and so IEA Bioenergy Task 39 um, is going to try to fill the gap in some of these uh, areas. So uh, we have collected data from the Renovo Bio files that were made available for public comment. And we're going to be issuing a summary report of the life cycle inventory data for sugarcane production later this year. We collected the data through 2020 um, and information from more than 60 mills um, have been collected. Um, so we missed the mills um, that went through the process in 2019, um, but I think the 60, more than 60 uh, samples um, that is a representative um, sample size uh, for the information. So there needs to be continual effort to update these secondary data sets if we want credible life cycle assessments. And there are lots of examples where the data is quite old in all of the models that are used for biofuel production. And not all of the old data overestimate the emissions. So I've come across some data sources that underestimate um, the emissions. So moving on to co-products, um, regulatory systems often prescribe the allocation method that should be used in a life cycle assessment. The allocation method can influence the reported results without any real change in emissions. And so two examples that I want to provide here uh, with respect to co-product allocation. One is uh, the issue of energy allocation, where neither the main product or the co-product is an energy carrier. And the second is I want to give you some examples of renewable diesel plant configurations that can influence the CI without changing the project emission profiles. So. Um, Red and Red 2 use energy allocation for co-products almost exclusively. There's one example, one um, the case that that's not the case. However, sustainability schemes have emission factors for nitrogen, but not for oxygen. And the rationale that was used is that oxygen is a co-product with no energy, so there can be no allocation of emissions to it. However, when you look into some of the LCI data sets, they say that oxygen is a primary product and that nitrogen um, is a co-product. Um, and so in that case, nitrogen would have no emissions. But the result of the current logic is that oxygen as a process input has zero emissions. 
So let's say we have a system with an oxygen blown gasification. Um, so if they bought the oxygen, they don't have to account for the, any emissions associated with that. But if they produce the oxygen on site with an air separation unit, they have to account for the electricity. Now the overall emissions are probably higher if they're buying the oxygen because there would be transport emissions and maybe liquefaction emissions if they can do liquid oxygen. But the regulation would seem to incent the approach with higher emissions and has the potential to distort the market. The other um, examples that I want to work through are renewable diesel plants. So renewable diesel plants produce a range of co-products uh, from fuel gas um, through to naphtha. The California Low Carbon Fuel Standard Program now gives a displacement credit for fuel gas but uses energy allocation for LPG and naphtha. The emission reductions from the use of the LPG and the naphtha are only accounted for if those products are sold in California. So if the product is not used in California, then the emission reductions from using a renewable LPG or renewable naphtha to displace fossil LPG and fossil gasoline are not accounted for in the carbon intensity. Energy allocation effectively truncates the system boundary so that emission benefits from the use of the co-products are outside of the system boundary. So some renewable diesel plants are now being designed to use the LPG and the naphtha to produce the hydrogen for the process. This emission reduction from the use of the coal products is now reflected in the renewable CI because there's no natural gas that goes into making the hydrogen. And they can get that um, CI reduction no matter where the plant is located and where the coal products are used. And so these plants are going to have lower CIs because the co-products are effectively getting a displacement credit, even though California gives a energy allocation credit if you sell these products rather than use them yourself. There are unintended consequences here of the allocation approaches used in regulations that are poorly understood by the regulators. Using a uniform approach to allocation for all systems, while recommended in the ISO LCA guidelines, will distort the market. There is a need for regulators to better understand the consequences of the choices that they make when they design low carbon fuel programs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present great map cycle analysis result for bioethanol. At our National Laboratory, we began to develop the grid model since 1995 with annual update and expansion. The model is available at the grid website as you see on the screen. The model has two major modules, grid 1 and grid 2. The grid 1 module is the fuel cycle analysis model and grid 2 is the vehicle cycle module. Today, my presentation covers the result from uh, GRID 1. As of last uh, summer, we have over 43,000 registered GRID users worldwide. The users include uh, energy companies, automakers, and government agencies. A large number of users are in North America but we do have a significant number of users in Asia, Europe, and other parts of the world. This slide presents uh, the uh, many groups of energy systems included in grid. We have uh, different pathways from petroleum, from natural gas, and hydrogen production from a variety of uh, feedstocks and electricity generation from uh, many sources and uh, generation technologies. The biofuel production pathways including the first generation feedstock, second and uh, algae feedstocks. Most recently, we add uh, electrofuels from renewable hydrogen and CO2 sources. There are many biofuel production pathways we include in green. As you see, we have uh, several feedstock groups on the left side, different biofuels on the right side with different conversion technologies. 
the your hard options has significant values in California's LCFS and uh, the US EPA's RFS, for example. We know ethanol has significant volume, renewable natural gas, and biodiesel renewable diesel. For example, in the US, ethanol accounts for 15 billion gallons nationwide, at least 1.1 billion gallons consumed in California. This slide presents the specific stages we include in bioethanol LC. We separate into feedstock stage, conversion stage, and uh, biofuel combustion. In feedstock stage, we include energy use and uh, chemical use in farms. And of course, for chemical use, we uh, push all the way to chemicals production. The feedstock production produce emissions from uh, on-farm energy use and to all emissions from nitrogen fertilizer and uh, greenhouse gas emissions from land use change. In the conversion stage, the emissions are produced uh, from the energy use and process chemicals use. For now, all the biofuel regulations in place or under development among the biofuel for facility certification. That's including the LCFS Tier 1 and Tier 2 uh, certification. The EU IED 2 are the forthcoming Canadian clean fuel standards are non feedstock certification, but California LCFS does not have non feedstock certification yet. This chart summarizes five ethanol production pathway CIs versus gasoline CIs in the US. Of the five ethanol pathways, except uh, sugarcane ethanol, we include uh, land use changes. For sugarcane ethanol, even though we did not conduct analysis of land use changes, many other studies have, have done land use change for this pathway. Relative to the 93 grams per megajoule for gasoline, old ethanol pathways result significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. For example, core ethanol achieved more than 40% reduction in GHG emissions, and cellulosic ethanol has much lower greenhouse gas emissions. For core ethanol, the result is based on GRID 2020 with the US average core farming data. Land use change is included, but on the other hand, the SOC change from farming practice are not considered here in this chart. This part chart show you the greenhouse gas emission sources for core ethanol. So as you can see, the feedstock is a significant contribute to core ethanol LC result. About 40% of core ethanol carbon intensity is from uh, farming. Plus, we have about 12% uh, greenhouse gas emissions from land use change. So after that, as we all know, fuel production stages of significant GHG emissions. And for feedstock, as you see, the bar on the right side, N2 emissions from soil is a significant source. And fertilizer and chemical manufacture is the next significant source for feedstock related GHG emissions. Most recently, we uh, explored different options to reduce core ethanol greenhouse gas emissions for the more. So the result here in this chart shows the cumulative reduction with additional options added to, a bio, uh, to the baseline greenhouse gas emissions. For example, replacing natural gas with renewable natural gas from biomass could reduce the CI by 20 grams per megajoule. 
And with R&D, renewable electricity, and uh, carbon capture storage, CI of core ethanol must be lowered to 6 grams per megajoule. Adding lower farming input and uh, green ammonia options could push CI to near zero. And uh, furthermore, sustainable farming, such as cover crops, could achieve negative CI given SOC accumulation credit in the field. As we all know, the land use change induced emissions has been a hot topic for core ethanol and for other biofuel pathway, pathways. This chart summarizes the lead use change greenhouse gas emissions from, from past studies since 2008. As you see, the first lead use change study concluded about 104 grams per megajoule. But since then, the uh, lead use change emissions has reduced uh, to about uh, 30 grams in the first few years. And uh, further additional studies conclude uh, the emissions are below 20 grams. And our great results conclude uh, land use change, change emissions are below 10 grams. So what are the factors for the result as you see here? Here are a list of the critical factors. The first area is the so-called land intensification and extensification. For example, crop yield in existing cropland versus new cropland, global yield differences and potentials, double cropping on existing land, or extension to new land types crop lead, grass lead, forest lead, wet lead, etc. Also, price elasticity is assumed in the economical models that are used for log simulations as an important fact. For example, crop yield responses to price, food demand responses to price. Finally, SOC changes from land conversion and land management has significant effect. Also, we know there are large variations for feedstock CIs in different regions. This slide shows the uh, feedstock CI variation among the major Midwest, uh, U.S. Midwest state. So as you can see, the lowest state is Minnesota, is about 25 grams per megajoule. The highest uh, is uh, 32 grams in Indiana or Ohio. And most recently, we use uh, um, um, soil organic carbon model to simulate uh, some uh, major farming practice uh, to examine the influence on feedstock uh, CIs. So here we uh, simulate uh, several farming practices, including manure, nitrification inhibitor, no TNH, cover crops, and two types of cover crops, and finally yield inputs. The first bar shows the direct uh, input change to farming. The second bar that's green shows the SOC change from land management change. Then the uh, blue bar shows the aggregate result. And besides national average result, as you see on each bar, we uh, show the variation among the states. So this additional land management change can result in significant greenhouse gas reductions for core ethanol from both SOC changes and direct farming activity GHG emission changes. Along with uh, land management change, N2O emissions contribute to the most of the uh, 
feedstock green hot gas emissions. So from that result, we recently built uh, on calculate that we call feedstock CR calculate. The calculate uh, relies on farm level data, such as uh, yield, energy input, fertilizer input, and uh, potential SOC change. And we not on greenhouse gas intensity, intensities of different input from grid and generate a result for feedstock. So the feedstock CR is linked to the rest of uh, the grid to build LC result for um, feedstock CR. For now, the calculate include corn for ethanol, but we have ongoing effort to include soybean, sorghum, and rice. So in summary, core ethanol greenhouse gas emissions has continued to go down. So now we uh, show more than 40% reduction in GHG emissions with lead use changes. And the improvements in core farming at ethanol plant has contributed to the downtrend. Additional opportunity exists to reduce core ethanol CRs further that includes sustainable farming practice and use renewable energy and uh, CCS in ethanol plant. Biofuel feedstock certification allows agriculture to participate in deep decarbonization. EU and Canada give credit for SOC changes from improved uh, land management uh, practice. Sustainable production of biofuel feedstock provides significant opportunity for further reduction of biofuel CR. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I would like to start this presentation to introducing myself. I am Mateus Chagas from the Brazilian Biorenewables National Laboratory, one of the four national labs in the Brazilian Center for Research in Energy and Materials, the CNPEN in Brazil. And today I will present the study about the comparison of biofuels life cycle analysis tools conducted by me and my colleagues, Antonio Bonomi, Otavio Cavalet, Bruno Klein and Maria Souza. So let's start. The comparison of biofuel life cycle analysis tools was divided into three phases. The, the first one for first generation ethanol, the second for the oil based biofuels, and the last one for lignocellulose for second generation ethanol. This presentation focuses on this last part. And its main motivation is the comparison of different life cycle assessment models and the identification of the main difference and similarities in methodological structures, calculation procedures, and assumptions to demonstrate that it is possible to obtain homogeneous results for similar production chains. Well, we know that bioenergy plays an important role in the decarbonization of the transportation sector. And the medium and long term benefit of bioenergy depends on the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in comparison to the fossil based energy. The decarbonization impacts of biofuels can be quantitatively determined through the life cycle analysis, but discrepant results are often obtained using different life cycle analysis tools. Then, to identify the main difference in commonalities in methodological structures, calculation procedures, and assumptions, providing a detailed understanding of how and why GHG results diverge between different LCA models. So, these studies focus on understanding the particularities of second generation ethanol production systems from lignocellulosic residues using different, different LCA models. Well, talking a little bit about the models, the four models that were compared in this study were the, the new European Commission model from the Europe, 
the J Genius model from Canada, the Grit from the United States of America, and the Virtual by Refinery from Brazil. The results in these studies were limited to the greenhouse gas emissions determined by each model, which is the full conditions to, to which they were de developed using a cradle to pump analysis. In this, this slide, we can see more information about the models, their versions, and information also regarding the greenhouse gases they consider in the IPCC method they, they have and, and so on. It is important to, to note that they have different ways to treat the co-product in the, the biorefinery concept. So they can use even allocation or substitution to, to deal with the, the impacts of the core products. Some of them consider also impacts related to land, land use changes and, and also regarding the, the boundaries. They, they can consider even the well to, to will boundaries or the well to pump. Well, in the first step, we, we have compared the, all the four models with the default feedstocks and the default values for the second generation ethanol in a standalone industrial plant using agricultural res residues to produce the lignocellulosic ethanol. We can see that all models considering the same uh, boundaries in the same process in, in the, the life cycle that is studied. They consider as a first step the recovery of the residues from the field and then the industrial conversion of the residues into second generation ethanol and finally the distribution to, to the pump. And for this comparison, we have stopped the, the boundaries at this point, all the four models considering ethanol as the main core product and electricity as a core product, and the cogeneration system uses lignin for the generation of heat and power. The GHNUs and grid considering the substitution procedure for to deal with the, the electricity, while the new EC model considering energy allocation. And in the virtual sugar cane biorefinery, the economic allocation procedure is used to, to deal with the, the corporate product. Here you can see a simplified flow chart of the second generation ethanol production process considered by the models. The lignocellulosic feedstock is firstly pretreated and then hydrolyzed. The soluble sugars are fermented then distillated and separated to produce the, the ethanol, while the, the solid residues are used in the cogeneration systems to, to produce the electricity. Going to the results of the comparison, we can see that the net impacts of each model, which are presented in the black dots, vary significantly. Even when comparing with GHNUs and the new EC model, which considering the same raw material to produce ethanol, the wheat straw. In general, the differences are justified by the different inputs, values, and emissions factors in each model. But some particularities of the models can help us to identify the difference. For example, GHNUs and grid considering substitution procedure for electricity. And we can see the benefits related to this co-product in the green bars reducing the net impact for these models. In the pathway for residues recovery, which are represented in the blue bars, both GHNUs and grids have the highest emissions. Those two models consider replacement of fertilizers due to residue removal. However, grit also considering avoiding nitrogen emissions related to the residues that are collected from the field. 
and do, do not rem remain the field decomposing and, and, and generating the, the nitrogen emissions. The virtual sugar cane biorefinery also considering the bills of oil emissions, as we can see in the negative blue bar. The new EC model presents the highest transportation emissions, as we can see in the orange bar, because this model considers the highest transportation distance between the, the field and the industrial facility. Neither the new EC model nor the virtual biorefinery considering the energy input for the industrial processing, while grit and GHG news considering diesel input in the industry, making the yellow bar higher for those models. So if the default values of the LCA for second generation ethanol are so different between the, the models, if we harmonize the input data in the models, could we obtain similar results? So in this section, we, we did this harmonization for greeting GH news. As we just saw, the results uh, of the default values are quite different between those two models. And in this table, we can see the main reasons why the results in the default conditions of the models are quite different. For example, the fact that GHGs do not consider any credit or debt for carbon changes in the soil, neither they avoid the nitrogen emissions due to the biomass removal, while the, the grid model does consider the, the, the avoided emissions. Oh, another difference that you can point at is that the GHGs, for example, do not consider the, the enzyme that is used in the industrial process and the grid model consider the, the avoided eye look emissions and using the residue for to produce ethanol and, and to harmonize the models firstly we uh, added the avoided any O2 emissions in the GHGs to consider in the same conditions that is used in grid, then we harmonize the industrial inputs followed by the industrial yields and also harmonize the allocation procedure. And in the next slide, you can see the results of this harmonization. This slide presents the results obtained after harmonization of second generation ethanol production from corn stover using GHGs and grid models. It is important to highlight that the new EC model was not included in the harmonization procedure, because despite the, the data for several scenarios being available online, the spreadsheet with the calculation tool is locked for addition by users. Thus, we could not use this model for this, this specific harmonization exercise. The harmonization was performed retrieving data from in parameters from grid and including it in GHGNU's model. For the harmonization, these parameters were selected. They avoided the NO2 emissions from from the field, industrial diesel consumption, avoided the look emissions, industrial yield co product credits and any O2 emissions from the boiler. The selection of them was carried out due to their relevance for difference among the two models and consequently in the final results of the models. These figures clearly indicate that the difference among the assessed models decreased considerably and they reached similar results after harmonization of a few chosen inputs and parameters. The harmonization of avoided NO2 emissions present the highest contribution to approximate grid to GHG news results. The remaining small differences among the results are due to some unharmonized points like the particularities regarding the calculation pro processors from each model, 
the emissions factors and the characterization factors. And in this table, we can see the differences in, in the characterization factors among the, the models. It's worthwhile to mention that GHENUS allows the, the user to change its characterization factors, and that would lead to more similar results compared to, to GRID. However, as mentioned before, this study considering only the default pathways for the comparison. So to finish, I would like to thank the Task 39 of the International Energy Agency for the financial support for this study. And also I would like to thank the steering committee for the valuable comments and su suggestions that helped a lot in this study. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Dina Bachowski. I work with BEST in Austria and I'm talking today about the role of renewable fuels in decarbonizing road transport. So I will take you into uh, a study that we've been performing over the past two years together with around 20 experts from the IEA Bioenergy TCP and from the Advanced Motor Fuels TCP. And um, the, the core of the assessment uh, was countrywide assessments of the transport fleet and its evolution up to 2050, which was done by experts from VTT. And I have the pleasure of introducing uh, the outline of these assessments to you and some results. So what would we, did we do? Um, specific country assessments were performed for Finland, which was the case model, uh, which has already previously before our study had been executed uh, in the scope of a large project. And um, because it was so successful, we decided to use the, this model and also apply it to other countries, which were Sweden, Germany, USA and Brazil. First, uh, we, we had to find country experts. So this happened from the, the uh, IA Bioenergy and the Advanced Motor Fuels networks. Um, we had a country expert for each of the countries assessed and uh, these experts delivered an input data file, which was based on the stated policy of that country and had separate sheets, uh, one for uh, fuel standards and sales of different fuel types another for the projected vehicle sales per fuel type and class of vehicle, uh, one for expected transport work and fuel consumption, again, per uh, class of vehicle, and outlook on biofuel production and the raw materials, and the data on the electricity generation. This was used for the electrofuels part of the study. Um, this input file data that was then implemented to the ELISA model. This is a Finnish made model at VTT, uh, which can be used to calculate the transport fuel use and the associated tank to wheel CO2 emissions from road vehicles. And uh, this ELISA model was already existing. Uh, the main variables in the input data, data for each of these vehicle categories uh, were the market share of each fuel or energy option, the annual average mileages, the total mileages, the specific fuel or energy consumption per vehicle category. And the vehicle categories were cars, vans and light duty trucks, buses, medium duty trucks and heavy duty trucks. We covered all vehicle powertrain and fuel options, as you can see listed here, and uh, also all the uh, fuel energy options um, that are, were in use in these countries. Uh, so we had fossil gasoline, fossil diesel, ethanol in various blends, uh, renewable diesel fuels, electricity and hydrogen. Um, the options were available for each vehicle category, but um, they were not always used. So in some countries, uh, you have specific fuel qualities, um, for example, E27 and hydrous ethanol, E100, only um, are used in Brazil. And uh, also, uh, not all combinations with all uh, vehicle categories are possible.
So what was the output of that process? We could uh, calculate the vehicle park composition per vehicle category and fuel energy option from year to year, starting 2020 up to 2050. Um, we had the annual mileages per vehicle and total for the vehicle type and the use of the different fuels. Um, and all of this uh, was put together and uh, then we calculated for each of the case country, countries uh, the progression of the CO2 emissions and uh, also the relative and the actual amounts of the biofuels. Uh, also, we could separate the contributions to the tank to wheel CO2 emissions um, for uh, three distinct measures. One being the electrification of transport vehicles, another being improvements in energy efficiency, and the third being biofuels. So by this uh, separating the contributions, we could show how much um, can biofuels contribute uh, in relation to how much does electrification contribute. Uh, we looked at uh, several different scenarios. The most important one actually is already the current policy scenario because we could derive quite some uh, interesting insights from, from that already. And as I told you before, we uh, can separate uh, the impact that each of the three measures, energy efficiency, biofuels and electric vehicles has. Uh, we also calculated a more EV scenario with a faster uptake of electric vehicles a max bio scenario that would maximize the use of biofuels up to the technical possible limit in the respective country, and uh, an e-fuel scenario looking at what happens if we cover all of these, um, all of the fuel demand with e-fuels. So let's turn to some of the results of the country assessments. I would like to, to highlight that uh, we had quite differing countries here. So the five uh, show great variation in, in indicators such as uh, population size, population density, cars per capita, car kilometer driven per capita and uh, freight kilometers per capita. Uh, so by doing the same assessment uh, for each of these very different countries, we could derive some results uh, that uh, that were, we can show that they are um, valid in all the different settings. So uh, just to explain how we did it, um, we looked at uh, the new car registrations per fuel type uh, for the passenger car sector. So this is the expected picture for Finland. And you can see that currently the gasoline vehicles provide the highest share in sales, um, but this is expected to shrink as well as the contribution or the sales of diesel cars is expected to shrink. And instead, um, the, the expectation is to see battery, battery electric vehicles coming in quite rapidly. Uh, what does this mean in evolution of energy use? And of course, this is not only for the passenger car sector down here in blue, but uh, we did the same uh, sales type analysis also for the other sectors uh, of vehicles. And um, so Finland expects to see also in the current policy scenario uh, that the energy use in the transport, road transport sector will decrease. Uh, if we take a look at which are the fuels in use, you see down here is the fossil gasoline uh, with some ethanol on top of that. And uh, then we have a large proportion of fossil diesel fuel that uh, the diesel use as such is shrinking over the years. And um, the renewable diesel is also expected to take a large proportion in this uh, diesel fuel segment. And also on the top in yellow, you can see the electricity coming in as an energy carrier. So what does that mean in tank to wheel CO2 emissions? And here I should state that um, we were assuming zero tank to wheel CO2 emissions for electricity and also for biofuels. Um, you can see that also the CO2 emissions will decrease uh, uh, over the years uh, with the largest contribution to this, again, coming from a decrease in emissions from the passenger car sector. 
um, most of it due to um, electrification. So here is the picture again with the CO2 emissions. The green line represents the um, base case or the current policies. Um, and we've separated out what is the contribution of each of the measures. So if we would do nothing, we would have the red line on top. Uh, if we just do electrification, we get the blue line. Uh, if we add to that the energy improvements, we get the yellow line. And if we add the contribution of biofuels, we add the green line. And you can see that currently, and uh, for quite a long time, up to around 2030, 2035, biofuels are contributing the most to reducing the um, tank to wheel CO2 emissions, while electrification becomes more significant only after that. But in 2050, we'll provide a large share of this CO2 emission reduction. Uh, let's take a look at the other countries as well. So um, they are quite different. Um, you, you will see, if you remember the picture for the car sales split in Finland, uh, this Swedish picture looks quite similar as well as the German picture, uh, with, but with a slower battery electric vehicle uptake. Um, the US um, in the current policies does not expect such a quick uptake of battery electric vehicles, but uh, rather remains constant in gasoline vehicles. And uh, for Brazil, uh, the expectation is that the ethanol flex fuel vehicles, which are the gray part in this picture, uh, will continue to be the most important part of car sales for a long time. Uh, but then the hybrid electric vehicles and battery electric vehicles will come in as well. Um, if we look at the energy use per vehicle category in 2030 in each of the countries, <clears throat> then we see that in Germany the cars dominate, uh, while in the US the van and SUV sector dominates. And in Brazil we have a very large contribution from buses. Finland has the largest truck sector. If we look at the energy use per carrier, uh, then we see that in the US gasoline dominates and in Germany it's diesel that dominates. Finland has a high share in renewable diesel use and uh, in Brazil ethanol uh, has a very large uh, proportion. And then please bear in mind that also the gasoline share here already contains 27% of ethanol. Um, we also see biomethane coming in and uh, electricity uh, here shown for Sweden, uh, but these are rather, rather um, low values compared to the others. Uh, now comparing the tank to wheel CO2 emissions for current policy scenario for the um, countries, we have Finland, uh, Sweden, and Germany, all with um, decreasing uh, tank to wheel CO2 emissions, and Brazil um, with expected rise in CO2 emissions since uh, the economy is still going to grow a lot in Brazil, and so will the <clears throat> transport sector emissions. Just to have a short glimpse into the e-fuel scenarios, um, here we assume that um, fossil fuels will be replaced by uh, biofuels as in the current policy scenario. And on top of that, um, the remaining fossil fuels starting from 2030 will be replaced with um, e-fuels. So we are bringing down the CO2 emissions. Uh, but uh, this comes at the expense of quite some needs in uh, renewable electricity generation. So in blue, you see the demand of that country in 2050, and it's compared to the current non-fossil generation of electricity in that country as of today. And you can see that for Germany and Brazil, this um, will be really challenging to achieve that growth in renewable electricity generation that would be needed to cover that e-fuels demand. And the uh, same for CO2 demand. Um, so in blue is the demand in 2050 and in orange, the current industrial CO2 emissions. And this will be hard to cover, at least in the case of Brazil. 
So in summary, the cases were a good selection because they were really different. Um, all cases lead to reductions in tank to wheel CO2 emissions, except for Brazil, because that economy is still growing. Uh, we could show the different contributions of electrification, energy efficiency, and the use of biofuels. And that the use of e-fuels is an interesting option, but quite challenging um, on the resource demand uh, for especially renewable electricity. So with this, I would like to thank for your attention and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participant of the BVS conference of the session from the IEA Task 39, my name is Franziska Müller-Lange. I'm head of the Department Biorefineries at the German Biomass Research Center. And um, at the same time, I have the honor to be the national team leader for the IEA TCP Bioenergy Task 39 on biofuels. And today I would like to present you some results of our work on synergies of bio-based and electricity-based process chain on the example of a PTG Hefa um, refinery. Yes, um, I think we all of are aware about um, the uh, tremendous role of energy demand and their coupling to the um, related CO2 equivalent emissions, uh, which um, are especially relevant for the transport. Here you see the total energy demand in transport in the European Union for a more or less status today, but also scenarios um, uh, in the framing of the Paris Agreement until 2030 and 2050 of um, different studies um, with different um, frame assumptions on technologies, revolutions and evolutions, but also on um, yeah, uh, disruptive uh, reduction of the total energy demand for transport. And you see that especially in the scenarios for 2050, that there is um, a special role of renewable fuels, especially for transport sectors like um, heavy duty truck, but also aviation. And aviation is the example which I will deal today in my presentation. Therefore, uh, um, we added some, some numbers on the jet fuel demand worldwide in the perspective of 2030. Um, of course, a bit to see in the frame of the COVID uh, pandemic, but also the um, relevant uh, sustainable aviation fuel SAF demand, which is expected in the years to come of more than 6 million tons. As I said, um, there are different approaches to deal with syn bio PTX synergies of bio-based and electricity-based technologies. We have uh, different approaches dealing with sustainable biomass on the energy crop residue base, for instance, with the different um, conversion routes and intermediates. And there we have, for instance, with biomethane and bioethanol routes that um, allow for CO2 emissions that can be further used in different applications, for instance, to synthesis. And then we have this huge uh, topic of renewable electricity, either for direct use, but um, increasingly of interest also to be used for so-called green hydrogen via water electrolysis, where we end up with an hydrogen that can be easily used together with CO2 and different product synthesis. And of course, we need hydrogen, for instance, for hydro treatment processes to treat products to fuels and other chemicals or intermediates and that stuff. Today, I would like to present you an example of a PTG HEFA refinery powered to gas for hydrogen, HEFA for hydro-treated esters and fatty acids for sustainable aviation fuel. And here you see our general approach for this hybrid um, refinery, where we have this um, yeah, well-known process of feedstock pretreatment, hydro-treating isomerization rectification to different fuels. Our focus fuel is HEFA SPK, um, as um, relevant for the ACM standard. And then we have been considering different approaches to come to the hydrogen supply required for these refinement um, processes, either by um, electrolysis from, with electricity from the grid or standalone with renewable energy, but also via steam reforming 
conventionally via natural gas or biomethane, or even this uh, internal refining of naphtha to um, supply hydrogen as demanded. And here we have been considering different feedstock that are relevant um, with a special focus on, on, on that case here, for an example, in Germany. We have um, a scenario set up and have been investigating 10 different scenarios where we, um, of course, are considering the electricity supply for the, um, yeah, for the electrolyzers or the steam reforming as one uh, important point. And then we change the application of the feedstocks. And last but not least, we change the main product uh, instead of FIFA SPK diesel, as it is usually the case um, and um, mainly known as HVO rescue. I would like to present you some results. Here you see the fuel production costs of the 10 different scenarios where we um, consider the different capital costs for the HIFA plant in the PDG plant as hydrogen supplier, um, as well as different variable and fixed operational costs uh, related to feedstock, but also um, electricity and that stuff. And you see here the different ranges and impacts. And moreover, we have been considering re-reuse for NAFTA, for instance, of fuel gas, um, um, uh, yes, for example. And we ended with, with total production costs. And here you see that especially with including hydrogen from electrolysis, costs are significantly increasing, um, at least for the renewable case and standalone plan, which um, is related to the buffer of for the hydrogen, but the electrolysis itself and the capacities related to that, then we have, we see that especially the case for NAFTA internal reforming is um, quite sufficient for with cost regard issues. And um, of course, I would like to highlight the case, which is today the usual case where um, diesel is produced as the main product uh, with the cheapest fuel production costs. Nonetheless, all of the scenarios uh, show fuel production costs, which are um, at least three times um, higher than um, the current jet fuel costs. Let's move to the THC emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, that have been balanced according to the Renewable Energy Directive, uh, directive methodology for the same uh, 10 scenarios. And here you see in blue, the hydrogen production related um, THG emissions in green, all which is relevant for feedstock supply and pretreatment, and the black ones, which is the HIFA process itself and the refinement to HIFA SPK and or diesel. And here you see that um, this highly depends, of course, on the hydrogen supply frame. Uh, we have this nice situation with standalone of renewable electricity, which show the highest THG mitigation potential. We see that feedstocks are quite relevant for the overall um, THG uh, mitigation and, of course, also the product mix. When we compare this and add um, um, additional cases where we did the same for favorable regions, um, outstanding of, of uh, Germany in, in Europe, we have been considering Sweden and Spain, for instance. Then we also considered Namibia as, as a region which um, uh, we had that might have uh, favorable conditions for renewable electricity supply. And we did the same calculations there. Then we come to the spreadsheets where we can compare GHG emissions and fuel production costs for the different cases and see that with regard to the minimum CHG mitigation potential need to be reached by uh, the existing renewable energy directive. It's now more than 65%. Then we see that we just have a couple of references that are relevant with high share on renewable electricity, or even with regard to costs that are using um, yeah, UCO residue oil or biomethane. Um, as, as options that are um, yeah, could fulfill all the requirements. So we have both, we have the feedstock, we have the hydrogen that are relevant and um, yeah, the process energy provision itself as well. 
So with that, I would like to conclude. Um, um, we all are aware of the strong demand on renewable fuels for the um, yeah, energy sector, especially for, for transport and their role for um, climate change and GHG mitigation. Um, uh, I showed you an example of the Sun via PTX a, a refinery approach where we are combining hydrogen and HIFA as an example to produce um, sustainable aviation fuel, where uh, we consider 10 different scenarios um, with regard to the hydrogen supply with the feedstocks, but also with the different product mixes out of the HIFA plant. Um, with regard to the cost, we can uh, conclude that um, they, of course, highly depend on the feedstock and the hydrogen related costs. But anyhow, they are several times higher uh, than jet fuel, which is really um, a challenge to bring renewable fuels into the market of aviation. And um, of course, the, um, it's all about GHG mitigation. Despite all scenarios show a mitigation potential of at least 50% um, for the renewable energy directive, it need to be at least 60, now with a reduced 65%, which is just fulfilled with some cases of the same scenarios. And um, we have this renewable electricity mix, which is relevant, but also the process energy and the feedstock itself are crucial points to maximize GHG mitigation. Last but not least, as it is often discussed to transform such approaches into regions where we have quite favorable conditions for renewable electricity, we see considering GHG um, emissions, but also uh, related costs, that there is not that significant benefit uh, compared to other scenarios that we have um, considering in that regard. So with that, I would like to end my presentation. I thank you very much for your interest. Um, be invited to, to check um, some more results and details explained in the papers related for this hybrid refinery. And of course, it would be a pleasure for me to answer any question with regard to the DBF set or at least to our biorefineries department. So um, with that, thank you very much. Have a nice day and um, take care. Bye.